Hello, I'm Hillary, um, and I'm going to be talking about the secret skills that people without CS degrees can bring to tech. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a full stack software developer at 10 Forward Consulting in Madison. Uh, your lanyards, that's us. Um, I tweet a lot. There's a lot of puns. If you don't like puns, probably don't follow me. <laughs> Um, I am a boot camp grad. I went to Omaha Code School and graduated. Actually, I found out last night, my boss told me that I have been at my current company exactly three years today. So, so that's handy for giving this talk. It works out well. Um, random fun fact, I'm immune to poison ivy. I have literally grabbed like handfuls of it, rubbed it on my leg. Nothing. <laughs> So yeah, if you have a poison ivy issue in your backyard, call me. I can take care of it. Um, first, before I get started, has anyone here, did anyone here go to a boot camp? Yeah, all right. Some people, that's awesome. So before I went to my boot camp, I've had a lot of different jobs. Um, the most relevant to what I do in tech include being a bartender and a server and being a journalist. The least relevant, I used to repair kites at a kite stand on the lakefront in Milwaukee. And literally half of my time was spent eating popcorn and untangling knots from this giant like 80 foot windsock that fell outside of the kite stand. It was a really great summer job when I was 15, but I, it was completely useless for most purposes. All right, so we're gonna look at boot camp grads versus uh, folks with computer science degrees. And I want to say at the beginning here that this is not a like one is better than the other kind of talk, right? This is just looking at what are some of the different skills that each group can kind of bring to the table, focusing specifically on people who don't have, who are either self-taught or in this case, you know, who attended a coding boot camp of some kind. So boot camps have been exploding. There was a thousand percent growth in the last like five years. I think that was up through 2017. That's insane. Um, just in 2017, there was 150% growth increase. And so I know that there was a lot of talk of, you know, dev boot camp here, no longer around, um, kind of a lot of high profile closings of boot camps. But even given that, there was, there was actually a lot of growth still in that year. Um, about 23,000 boot camp grads. I looked for data on how many folks graduated with CS degrees in 2017. The most recent data I could find was like 2015. Um, all of the, Estimates I found ranged pretty widely from 40,000 to 90,000. I'm gonna guess it's somewhere in there. Um, but even so, I was really surprised at what, like the, the number of, the high number of bootcamp grads compared to CS grads. I thought there, there would be much greater discrepancy there. So this is uh, indeed did a huge survey about um, people with bootcamp experience. You can see here that like the growth is exponential. I mean, it's the same that we saw with the other thing. Basically, a lot more people are going to boot camps than ever before. So, of course, more and more people are getting CS degrees too. There was, um, you know, it's just not nearly as fast, right? So I think it was 115% growth between 2009 and 2015 versus like 1,000. <laughs> um, it has been growing the last few years as well. I couldn't find specific data, but I do know that it has been growing. It's just not nearly as fast as boot camps. So we can see here, there was actually, while most STEM fields were seeing an increase in the number of graduates, computer science actually had this big dip. And it started to come back, like I said, the last few years, that, that trend has continued from what I've been able to find. But it's interesting that at the same time that boot camps were exploding, computer science was actually just getting back to where it used to be. So who is the average student that attends a boot camp. Turns out I'm very average. Um, I started mine when I was 29. The average age is 30. They have about 6.8 years work experience. I didn't actually count up how many years I had, but you know, I started working when I was like 15, so at least that much. And they have a Bachelor of Arts. So I graduated with, uh, I majored in journalism and political science. Or no, that's not right. Journalism and Spanish, I minored in political science. Journalism and Spanish. Uh, only 18% of CS degree graduates are women. That's held pretty true over the last few years. Um, when we look at boot camps, it's 45% are women or gender non-binary. So that's a huge increase. Yeah, go boot camps. 
Um, so if you're looking to hire more women or gender non-binary folks, like check out a boot camp. So like I said, this isn't a, a like one or the other kind of talk, right? A boot camp experience obviously is not the same as getting a computer science degree. But that the, the years of work experience, that liberal arts degree, you know, that the average boot camper has, that really means they're bringing a lot to the table that your average CS grad probably isn't. So we're gonna look at kind of what some of, what some of those skills are. Um, so a little bit more about my background. Like I said, I graduated from boot camp three years ago. Um, been a developer for the last exactly three years and uh, work now at a company that is pretty boot camp heavy. So I look through when we have six boot camp grads at our like 12 or 13 person company. So we're like half boot camp. So these are the five key lessons that I've learned over the last three years, not only being a boot camp grad and working in tech, um, but also working with other boot camp grads and then also tutoring at the YWCA in Madison, which runs a boot camp program. So kind of pooling together all of those experiences to see like, well, what are the main things that it seems like these folks on average, again, everyone's different, are bringing into the tech sector. So lesson number one, your voice has value. I talked to uh, four different folks I knew working in tech, um, all our developers, who went to boot camps and I said, you know, what do you think is the biggest thing that you learned before your boot camp that has served you well now in your tech career. And so I kind of have their voices interspersed throughout the presentation. So the first one that I talked to was my friend Alex. And she also, very typical boot camp grad, so she studied uh, gender studies and religion. She used to be a journalist. She's now a developer. And she really talked about the idea that who was doing the programming mattered, right? Not just what they were programming. My person wouldn't be the same without my past educational and professional experiences. So, uh, my last job in radio, or my last job in journalism was in radio, and I had never done radio before. I was a print journalist. Um, an opportunity opened up at an NPR station, so I took it because obviously, but it was really intimidating. I didn't have any vocal training. I had, you know, I hadn't done any kind of voice work. I, I really had no idea what I was doing and I was just kind of thrown into like, oh yeah, it's journalism, but you speak it and like that's just normal, which feels very unnatural. So I had to learn at that company, not just only how to find my literal voice that I wanted to use when I was reading my stories on the radio, but also metaphorically figuring out, you know, how does my voice fit into this structure? Similar to tech, I was the only woman on the reporting staff for a very long time. Um, I mean, I don't have to tell any of the marginalized folks in this room that that kind of sucks and it's very intimidating and you find your, you know, you silence yourself to a certain extent. Um, but I realized that that actually gave me a lot of power because I had a unique perspective. And so I tended to do the stories, like I was the only one doing stories that really touched on women's experiences. So, um, you know, access to uh, like prenatal care, access to um, abortions, um, you know, how to, what's the state doing to protect native women from violence perpetuated by non-native men, all that kind of thing. So just sort of realizing over time, the longer I was there that like, my voice had value and I should be using it because if I didn't, what I had to offer was not gonna be covered. Uh, but I did feel kind of like this little pink bit of fruit sometimes, surrounded by a bunch of yellow fruit. Just realize, and so, so what I really want folks to take away from this is like, even if you feel like you, like everyone in your office looks like you, like maybe you're white, you're a dude, um, you have you know, a degree, even if it's not in computer science, just the fact that folks went to a boot camp instead of going through a computer science program means they have a unique perspective. And so I think it's really important that we recognize that and empower those folks to be vocal about their perspective. Lesson number two, everything is a draft. So this is Sherielle, she actually works at 10 Forge. she's one of our developers, and she studied Chinese language and literature. And so she's talked a lot about how 
learning that language was very similar process, like prepared her really well for learning programming languages. I really like this. Sometimes you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think that's such a valuable lesson and she really embodies that at, at work, not giving up even when the code or the character doesn't quite fit. So the art of refactoring, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how my past experiences taught me about refactoring before I ever wrote code in my current job. So liberal arts, I mean papers, right? That's just a constant refactoring process. You have your drafts, you get feedback from your professor, feedback from your peers, you write it again, you maybe get more feedback. It's basically just four years or five years of constant refactoring. Service sector, so let's say you have a table of seven and they place their order and then you go back to put it in with the kitchen and the kitchen says, oh, we're out of the special, so you have to go back and they have to, two people now have to change their order. Uh, then someone realizes, oh, this food isn't vegan, turns out there's butter in here, so I'm gonna have to change what I'm getting. Uh, someone sends their food back once it finally arrives because it's overcooked, so you have to accommodate that and find something new. Uh, then a kid spills their soda on their dad's plate. His food is now ruined. Then the restaurant starts on fire. <laughs> this is not based on a true story, thankfully. But just illustrating this idea that you are constantly changing, you know, the ticket is changing, your expectations are changing, everything is in a constant state of flux and chaos. And somehow, most servers maintain this outward sense of calm, right? You would never know the chaos that is going on from just looking at your server's face, that practiced calm. So service, and I would argue retail too, are sort of constant refactoring, right? Like I said, it's not just your, your table's ticket or these very tangible physical things, but also your expectations. Which table is gonna be easy? Which one is going to be challenging? Which one's gonna tip well? Which one isn't? It's, it's just constantly reevaluating and adjusting based on what's happening around you. Uh, we also refactor a lot in code. So I went through to some of our repos and I just looked at the you know, total contributions that I'd made to those and how much code they add and how much did I take away. And we can see there's a lot of taking away as much as adding. This was not me, <laughs> but this was the one that I found from all of our projects that had the greatest range. And you can see that they deleted way more than they added. And so when folks can come into tech, already understanding that process, being familiar with it, being comfortable with it, that gives them a huge leg up when it comes to having to change their own code time and time again. Lesson three, delegate to meet deadlines. So Andrew was a former teacher, um, a nonprofit administrator, I think his degree was in English, and he talked about how his experiences in teaching made it a lot easier for him to interact with not only his technical peers, but also the non-technical folks on staff. And I really liked the line he said, I try to do it in a way that leaves everyone feeling comp competent, confident, and cared for. And I think if everyone in tech had that mindset when interacting with their coworkers, it would be a much better place for literally everyone. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how delegation is important, again, in the past work that I've done and then also how that applies to my job now in tech. So in journalism, I mean, there's an editor who has to approve your story in the first place. You have to talk to sources to report on the story. Fellow reporters help you find those sources. There's the sound engineer in radio who actually strings your clips together, records your takes. The honor host who introduces the story and gives the you know, introduction. Uh, same in service, right? Depending, obviously, what kind of place you're working in, um, there's maybe a host who seats your table. If you're the bartender, then someone else serves the food. If you're the server, the bartender probably makes your drinks. The cook has to make the food. Someone probably cleans your table when you're done. And if you can't manage all of these different pieces of the puzzle, then you're not going to be successful. You're going to make less money. Your boss is going to get mad at you. And so there's really a lot of strength in having these experiences with delegating and coordinating and dealing with a lot of different types of personalities and bringing them together to get what you need to happen. Coding, same thing, right? There's project managers, there's QA, there's you need to get fellow developers to review your code, uh, DevOps, designer has to get you mockups, and all these pieces have to fit together and work in a way that enables you to meet your deadlines so that you can be successful, the client can be successful, all of the other people at your company can be successful, so 
It just takes a lot of delegation in order to make things happen the way that we want them to. Uh, we talk at 10 Forward a lot about things being capital D done. So that means not just did you make a PR for the feature that you were assigned, but has it been vetted by QA? Is it on production? Are people using it? Have you tested it again on production to make sure that there aren't any bugs that you missed the first time around? And so again, to get to capital D done, you're really reliant on a lot of different people. And so it's important to have the skills to be able to, to coordinate all of those, those pieces coming together. Um, especially when we're talking about juniors, there's not always a lot, especially boot camp grads, there's not always a lot that they can do by themselves, 100% by themselves when they first start. But if they have those skills, those coordination skills, those delegation skills, when they enter your company, they're gonna hit the ground running a lot faster than someone with maybe a computer science degree who doesn't understand the politics and how to, how to make everything happen the way that they need. Uh, lesson number four, feedback is a feature, not a bug. So this is Jacob, he has a PhD in philosophy, and then he decided to switch into tech because uh, it turns out it's really hard to find a job if you have a philosophy doctorate. So he talks a lot about how when he was in school, there was this strong emphasis on discussion. So discussing you know, ancient Greek philosophical arguments or discussing your own peers' theories. And a lot of it really involved like, like thinking very critically and vocalizing that criticism. So he talks about how these communication skills have been essential to my work as a developer and how much feedback he would have missed out on without these skills, but also the ways that he has been able to persuade the others at his company that the way he wants to do it is the right way. Because he has, he's been doing this for, I don't know how long it takes to get a PhD, like seven years, eight years. Feedback is crucial to programming. Right, we have pull requests. Um, if you're working with the designer, you know, like, oh, I, I can't implement this type of feature on the timeline that we're working with. Can we, can we think about structuring it a little differently? Um, you know, there's just, there's a constant flow of feedback back and forth. However, I'm gonna quote Erica Baidu here. Keep in mind that I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit. <laughs> so, Without having the experience of receiving and giving feedback in a respectful, um, in a respectful manner and keeping sort of your own ego out of the way, it can be very hard to be a programmer without getting into a lot of fights. So again, looking at kind of how different jobs, liberal arts degrees, et cetera, experience these feedback loops that we then apply to the tech sector. So in journalism, you have to pitch your story first, right? You don't get anywhere off the ground if you can't convince someone that, hey, this is a good story to do. You know, we should let me go out and report this and give it space. Uh, editors come in when you have your draft written or recorded and they'll give you, I'll change this or that sentence is wrong or do something different with that. Copy editors who are basically the QA of journalism, nitpick it apart. And then the readers and listeners, right? So even if you get past all of these steps, and you think, oh, this is perfect, this is great, I'm, you know, I'm gonna win uh, an Emmy for this, uh, readers might hate it. And so how do you deal with that? And how do you grow from that? Bartending. Pretty much everyone has opinions about how you bartend. It's just kind of, you have to have pretty thick skin because everyone either hates it or loves it or wants something different or doesn't understand why they can't just play Hoobastank for you know 10 hours on your jukebox. They paid for it. That's a real story. <laughs> so yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of having to, having to deal with, with critical feedback that often isn't delivered in very nice ways. So learning to navigate and be receptive to critical feedback is so important for programming. And folks who come from liberal arts backgrounds or service backgrounds have a lot of practice with that. And I think that makes them really valuable as team members. That connects to the last lesson I have, which is that empathy is everything. So I'm gonna tell a few quick stories about experiences that I had in each of my jobs. So this is a photo I took in um, Nogales, Mexico. It's right across the border from Arizona. And we were doing a story about migrants. It was basically looking at sort of the modern day underground railroad and folks who kind of brought people crossing the border from like safe house to safe house to get them far enough in that border patrol wasn't an issue anymore. And this was a man who had been caught, I wanna say four different times trying to cross the border and deported back. Um, they were 
providing free medical care at a clinic right across from the deportation site. And he was in rough shape. I mean, he had blisters and cuts all along his foot because he didn't have shoes and he was trying to cross the little desert. And uh, malnourished, he was dehydrated, and it was just an experience that I hadn't really had to think about very much before, right? Immigration was always just a sort of vague blob. You know, my family came back from Germany like years ago, but like I feel very divorced from that experience. And so being there in person and talking to these folks and hearing their stories and just seeing the physical marks that their experiences had left on them was, um, it was just really eye-opening. Similarly, bartending, you meet literally every kind of person ever. And I was working an afternoon shift. I think it was probably like four o'clock. Bar's pretty empty. People are still at work, no one had come in yet. And so um, there was a woman who had come into town for a country music concert. Her husband had died recently. I gave her a drink and we're, we're chatting. There's really no one around. Her husband had died. She had married him right out of high school. She had no skills. She'd never had a job in her life. And when he died, she found out that they were deeply in debt. And she had to take a job. The only job she could find was part-time, minimum wage as an in-home care person. And so she really struggled to just make ends meet. But she'd saved up her money. She'd been working extra shifts because she wanted to come and see this concert. She bought a new shirt. She wanted to get one drink before she went to the concert because she could only afford one. So she came to us for our happy hour. And there was nothing I could do, right? It wasn't about how I could help her. It wasn't about what she expected from me. She just wanted someone to listen. And I think being able to listen is a skill and have and listen with empathy is a skill that is so crucial for tech. And if you work in service, you inherently have to have that skill. So we are not our users, right? We hear that all the time. And I think people who come from a boot camp background, because of their past work experience, because of the you know, sort of non-traditional lives that they lived in compared to their coworkers in terms of probably not being middle class, maybe not even having a college degree, having had a lot of different kinds of jobs, working with a lot of different kinds of people, I think that I would argue that the average boot camp grad sort of inherently understands this concept of we are not our user better than perhaps your average computer science grad. Uh, so I'm running out of time, but a few really quick thoughts on hiring boot camp grads. Um, we can see here, this just shows that, you know, there's way more jobs that we need to fill in programming than we have computer science grads to fill. I think everyone kind of knows about that. Um, I like to hire boot camp grads because they've already shown that they're comfortable with taking risks. I think that's a good thing. Um, this was also from that Indeed survey. They surveyed like a thousand HR managers and they said, hey, how are your boot camp grads working out? Right? Do you feel like they've been a disappointment? Have they succeeded your expectations? And the key thing here I want to point out is that 72% thought that they were just as prepared as computer science grads for the jobs that they took. And actually 12% thought that, thought that they were more prepared, which I didn't really expect that. So some best practices. Mentorship is really important, um, especially if they're the first boot camp grad at your company. They're going to probably feel um, a little inadequate. Right, because everyone else has a computer science degree. Everyone else understands more than they do. Everyone else knows more than they do, and that's probably true. And so how can you foster them in a way that makes them feel empowered and safe and like they are supposed to be there? So structure is also really important. Um, and then giving in that sense of community, like yes, you belong here, we want you here, you are a valuable member of the team. Uh, some citations, and that's all I've got. So if you want to check out the graphs and stuff, I have the slides online at uh, tinyurl.com slash beer bylines and booleans. Um, also, 10 forward is hiring, so come talk to me or like anyone at the Pikachu table in the back. <laughs> so yeah, thank you.